the necessity to think before we act arises on account of certain consequences that are expected to follow from the act this is the logic of the mind which by a process of internal argument known only to itself visualizes what follows and what ought to follow from a given set of circumstances the capacity of the mind to reach out beyond itself is something worth considering every conclusion that is drawn from known premises is actually a reaching in respect of a realm that is not the venue that one is occupying at present one cannot reach out to the future as everyone is living in the present but the presence of such a thing as a future and even the nature of that future possibility becomes the content of the present consideration due to the present being hiddenly present even in a future possibility perhaps pointing out at the same time that there is no past present and future there is a continuity because in order that we may be aware that there is such a thing called the past it has to become a content of the present consciousness even so is the case with the future that which is not yet and is yet to be can be known as such only when it has somehow got accommodated into the present consciousness the idea of a particular prevalent condition and the nature of the steps that we have to take in the direction of a future possibility all these things take us into the depths of our own mind there is a thing called mind which is understood in many a way philosophy or whatever it be vision of life or anything that you can think of deduction or induction anything in any manner whatsoever appears to be an activity of the mind which is which has been and which perhaps may never be a very intriguing concept a notion a visualization unless we have some idea of the way in which our minds operate it will be difficult for us to come to any sensible and reliable conclusion in regard to what the mind perceives or concludes as a verifiable fact the justification 
of conclusions drawn by mental cognitions. Then we are only on the limitation of the process of mental activity. The activity going on within our own self. Often people have felt that all our experiences are limited to the operations of our mind, and even the whole world as an object of experience. If all things in the world, whatever they be, are known to be there by a mind that acts. And they are known to be there in the manner of the activity of the mind. There is some point in the conclusion that all experience is subjective. The objectivity of the fact of an experience, though it has to be granted for certain other reasons, has also to get accommodated to the vision of the mind cast into the mould of its own inner constitutions. Our experiences are of the same shape and character as is the shape and character of our mind. We have different kinds of mind, each one of us, as is well known, and therefore we have all different kinds of experience of the world. Not only different kinds of experience, philosophically speaking, but even in our daily life we have different kinds of appreciation of values. Each one lives in a totally independent world as it were, to such an extent that the pleasures and pains of others do not affect materially the existence of a particular person. Even someone may die, that event of death does not materially affect or modify the life of an individual in any manner whatsoever. Such is the connection of the mind with the body. The historical controversies over the nature of things call it the point of view of the doctrine of materialism or of socialism or any other point of view has to be first of all described in the pattern of the operation of the mind itself. The vision of life is a mental vision and a parallel consideration of this nature we find in one of the chapters of the great work known as Panchadashi, written by the venerated sage Vidyaranya, in which he distinguishes between facts as they are or as they might be and facts as they appear to the minds of people. For certain reasons, we have to accept that there is something like a world outside. But the world that is really there outside is not the content of our daily experience. Our duties, anxieties and activities daily are a sort of abstraction from the world that perhaps really there outside, abstraction enough to get accommodated into the working of the mind in its own patterns. 
loves and hates which dominate all experience cannot be regarded as present in the objects outside in themselves the land the house the material wealth which is supposed to evoke reactions in the mind in the form of likes and dislikes do not and cannot be expected to have these qualities in themselves we do not know if land loves anybody a house has an affection for any person our material possessions have any sense of value as we seem to be attributing to them a lovable object or an object that is despicable from any point of view is an adumbration of that particular issue or the object from a unilateral appreciation by the mind of the individual or groups of individuals else it would be difficult for us to believe that gold or silver grains or land or wealth or house have in themselves any such quality that can be regarded as happy or unhappy these qualities which contribute to the happiness or the unhappiness of people these being life itself in its entirety these characteristics which are conditioning all human experience are not to be found in the world in the language of sage vidyaranya there is a distinction between ishvara srishti and jiva srishti ishvara srishti is the name that he gives to the world of actual objective perception and jiva srishti is the reaction set up by the perceiving individuals in respect of the truly existent objective world ishvara srishti a human being is just the same as any other human being anatomically physiologically biologically but a person is different to different persons by way of psychological relation it is my relation it is my friend it is my enemy someone related to me or someone unconnected with me and so on and so forth he is also the case with material possessions the experiences of life i have been considered to be psychological in their nature and it is futile to wrangle over the true nature of things going on arguing whether the world is material in its nature social in its nature economic in its nature or whatever it be these arguments seem to be out of point in as much as they hinge entirely in the end on the manner in which human minds operate there is no such thing as an economic condition for animals in the forest and many of the things that human nature considers as ultimately meaningful do not seem to have meaning for the subhuman species though they also are living beings they have the same hunger and thirst and the instinct of survival perhaps the mind can create a heaven or a earth or a hell at one moment in a single stroke of its internal action suddenly you will find yourself in heaven if the mind works in one manner or you will find yourself in hell in a second though 
it would appear that the physical world we can call Ishwara Sriti has not changed whatsoever. A shock of joy or a shock of sorrow, which is purely a mental appreciation of values, can change the entire world of experience in an individual. To such an extent, then even in hunger and thirst and sleep will be affected. Your life can end by excessive mental activity, either in the form of inconceivable joy or inconceivable grief. Such is the power of the mind. But where is this mind? History of psychology has attempted to locate the mind somewhere and we people who have studied so much spiritual texts, pictures, scriptures, philosophies and psychological tomes have our own idea of what the mind is. But mostly we are primitive in our concepts, whatever be our education or study. Primitive in the sense that we cannot help the feeling that the mind is some sort of thing inside our body. It is inside the body. Though we cannot argue out this opinion in a satisfactory manner, instinctively we are made to feel there is something moving inside the body like the ball of mercury or some sort of flexible and fluid element quickly adjusting its position from one part of the body to another part of the body. This is how we feel childlike in respect of mind's operations. If the mind is all life, all our experiences are mental, our life and death seem to be entirely conditioned by how the mind works. And if at the same time we begin to feel that the mind is inside the body, it would appear that we ourselves are inside our own bodies. But that is not the fact. We have never been able to come to a satisfactory conclusion even today as to where the mind is located, what is its relation to the body. Because neither can we say that it is the same as the body, nor can we say that it is quite different from the body. The entire distinction that is sometimes drawn between the mind and the body would lead to a peculiar situation where the mind cannot act on the body at all, while we feel the mind suddenly acts on the body, changing even physiological and chemical operations inside and vice versa, physiological conditions affect the mind also. So it is not entirely true that the mind is so very markedly set aside in some part of the body. It is vitally associated with the body as if it is permeating every cell. In as much as a parallel existence of mind and body cannot be conceded due to action and reaction appearing to take place daily between the mind and the body as if they are one and the same, as if they are two phases of one single element acting. Many have held that there is no such gap between the mind and the body. It is one single act taking place which for want of better words, we may say, is psychophysical. Sometimes it is psychosomatic. Psycho and somatic are not two different concepts. They are only two words used to convey a single operation which is not just partly physical and partly mental, 
but at the same time psychological and physical we are both mind and body at the same time we are mind body complex this is what we mean by saying psychophysical the human mind is also the human body and vice versa the human body is the human mind to such an extent that it appears that the body is nothing but a concrescence of the mind an ethereal rarefied form of the body seems to be the mind and a more dense form of the mind is the body the concept of the five koshas or sheaths well known to us in vedantic parlance seems to justify this feeling we have heard that there are sheaths annamaya pranamaya manomaya vijnanamaya anandamaya koshas described to us in such a way that we are made to feel that they are like five shirts that the soul is putting on like peels of an onion one being there over the other but the sheets are not so placed they are not coats or shirts or peels they are densities of a particular activity which is called individuality jivatva and we cannot demarcate the presence of one sheath from the presence and activity of another sheath there is a gradual density or condensation of activity we may say appearing to take place from inward to outward performance and a rarification from outward to inner conditions it is one single modification in a graduated system of concretization of experience from the center of our personality inwardly to the outer periphery of our experience ending with the physical body in a similar manner seems to be the relation of the mind to the body psychology in its history right from early times till the present day has been a very interesting study and its studies are not complete even today researches are being conducted to astonishing conclusions in respect of our own internal makeup we are great mysteries and wonders in our own selves we are not so simple individuals walking on the street going for a walk having our meal and going to sleep nothing of the kind is what we are very interesting complicated and inaccessible is our essential nature we are mostly in what they call the conscious level of activity we are just now conscious and this state of a conscious mental activity is mostly considered as the whole of activity whatever i am thinking just now is the only thing that i am capable of thinking this is again a crude understanding of how the mind can act and react there are immense possibilities in our mind which can shoot for such forms of experience that in a moment we can become different individuals to our own surprise and we would not be a moment afterwards what we were a moment before there are capacities in us to behave in all the forms of the species that appears to be there in creation 
every species is here embedded in a potential form in the human nature the lower as well as the higher the divinizing potentialities and the lower potencies are both present in the human nature the conscious activity of the mind is not actually the whole of the activity our life in the world is conditioned to such an extent by pressures from outside that we cannot be wholly free in our conscious life this limitation to our mental freedom arises on account of the existence of other people who also have similar mind and would expect a similar kind of freedom to act in society the conceding of freedom to others as one would like to have freedom to one's own self is at the same time a limitation that one puts on the freedom of one's own self you cannot be entirely free if other people also are to be equally free because the very existence of another is a limitation on the existence of your own self you cannot be free in as much as there are other things which are also clamoring to be equally free in as much as everyone cannot be absolutely free because absolute freedom granted to everyone would be the abolition of freedom to anyone so freedom seems to be a very peculiar thing because it implies the presence of a limitation together with what we consider as the act of freedom thus we do not seem to be entirely free in our conscious life we are bound souls even if we are free souls as we may appear to our own selves i may walk on the street who is to question me but you cannot walk on the street as you would like there are limitations set even on your walking on the street you know very well you cannot behave in the way you would like under the pressures of your own inner calls because every individual is a social unit fortunately or unfortunately the social aspect of the existence of an individual is the limitation set on the experience or freedom of the individual this limitation is not a happy thing though we know very well that it is not possible for us to live in the world with exercise of ultimate and final freedom because of the presence of other people and other things in the world it would create a feeling of rancor in our own selves we feel unhappy that other people are we would wish that they are not there because if nobody else is there one can be wholly free but this is only what they call building castles in the air it cannot be that others cannot be there others have to be there as anyone else has to be there so freedom has to be limited this consequence following from the limitation of the freedom that one exercises produces such an effect and impact upon the mind that it very sorrowfully receives these consequences and buries them inside every action produces a reaction so while thought can be regarded as real action the consequences result following from a mental action would be such impacts upon itself that it will receive them back and keep them in a chamber created by itself unknown to itself 
on the conscious level deceiving itself as it were as it as if these consequences have not followed at all we behave as if we are wholly free though we know that we are not wholly free this is a self deceptive psychological attitude which creates inward agony but this agony is not consciously felt since conscious agony would be a death blow to the very existence of the individual so the inner sorrows arising from the fact of a limitation set on human in- freedom is kept inside in a dark chamber inaccessible to the operations of the conscious mind as if there is another mind altogether which is different from the conscious mind actually it is a background of the very same mind part of which acts as the conscious level part of which acts as the subconscious or the con- unconscious whatever you may call which is at the back these feelings which are kept as a stock of the griefs of our own person lie there as ungerminated seed waiting for the rainfall of conducive circumstances at which time they can slowly germinate into action and surprise our own self because we would not know that they have been there at all the surprise arises because they have been kept in an unconscious form while we have been limiting our life to the conscious level only never knowing that we have other chambers of mental activity which are at the back of the conscious level the layers mentioned annamaya pranamaya etc are just the layers or the chambers of the human mind it is the mind itself that appears as these various layers called the koshas so these internal layers not being brought always to the surface of conscious activity lie inside dissatisfied sleeping with a sorrow of their own that they have not been brought to the surface of active consciousness which means to say you have been unfriendly with them because an unconscious friend is no real friend these inner chambers of our mind have not yet become our consciously known friends they clamor for this recognition if one of you is not recognized you would clamor for recognition by thrusting yourself in the crowd and making yourself felt somehow or other so that recognition becomes a conscious operation and you are not there as a very important person unknown to people so this desire to project oneself into conscious recognition is the element present in every fiber of the mental makeup but it has much as this is not always possible due to the pressure of society from outside we remain always in some percentage grief stricken individuals though outwardly we smile as if everything is fine and milk and honey are flowing in the world no person can be really happy in this world in as much as there is a restriction on every individual from prevailing outer circumstances this continuous repression of factors which are not pleasant to the mind later on becomes a thick cloud as it were covering the light of understanding here is the forte of all psychoanalytical observations that no thought of ours in the conscious level can be regarded as a wholly free activity of the mind we are determined by the inner potentialities of the seeds 
of possible experience but which have not yet come to the surface of conscious experience though psychology generally classifies human activity into the conscious subconscious and unconscious layers there are many more layers than these and the mentioned ones are only the operative distinctions drawn but not actually all the potentialities included there immense are the possibilities of the mind infinite are the capacities and we cannot count how many things are there in our own minds though it is true that this is the state of affairs in which the human individual lives the story is does not end here psychology psychoanalysis tells us that we are self deceiving persons there is no honesty in our approach this is so and this has to be so because we always are forced to behave as double personalities consciously something and subconsciously or unconsciously another thing the conscious behavior of ours is well known you know how we conduct ourselves in daily life in family affairs in political circumstances in our office etc this is something well known but there is something which is private which is known each by each person individually but privately also it is not often known due to the flood of conscious engagements in our daily life which occupy our attention to such an extent especially when we are very busy people that we cannot believe that there are inner calls at all a very busy person who is having no time at all for himself or herself being a very big gun in office in administration in business whatever it is such a person does not know that he or she has another personality all together inside which will come up to the high relief of potential action when business ceases office goes or there is deviation or separation from family circumstances everything is lost one stands alone for oneself at that time the true personality comes up spiritual seekers do not expect such a kickback from psychological nature though they know that such a kickback can be the fate of anyone one day or the other if proper attention is not paid to the potentialities in one's own self so what spiritual seekers generally do is they create an artificial atmosphere of aloneness in themselves not actually the aloneness that is thrust upon oneself by loss of property or uh, uh, getting kicked out from office etc they go to a sequestered place like uttarakhand or gangotri etc and live alone to themselves not having even correspondence with people not reading anything not seeing people just being one's own self for months and years if you live like this in your own self you will create an atmosphere in you which is almost similar to the atmosphere that comes upon oneself when everything is lost it is at this time when conscious activity ceases from its intensive operations that the inner calls come out the ungerminated seeds come up to the surface of action and you begin to feel what you really are you suddenly become unhappy after a few years of stay in gangotri alone you will feel that you are an unhappy person don't be under the impression you will find uh, you to be yourself to be an angel after do deep meditation nothing of the kind is possible you will find that some trouble has suddenly emerged from within your own self from sources which are unknown to you people who live in such isolated places for a protracted period come down to the cities in order that they may not go crazy because the pressure of the unfulfilled frustrated feelings 
often times become so intolerable that you have to palliate them by feeding them with their requirements that which you cannot do in a sequestered place like gangotri or top of mount everest but all the same this is something worthwhile knowing what kind of persons we are the necessity to know all the inner potentialities of our arises because we are all these potentialities unknown things are not non existent things therefore unknown potentialities in us are not something other than what we are they are just be so it is necessary for us to be good psychologists of our own selves not just teachers of psychology to the students in a college but we should know how our own mind is working if we are happy just now why are we happy what has happened to us if suddenly a mood of depression takes possession of us what is the matter something is not all right something is wrong with me many a time the extent of conscious life in which we get involved is so intensive that we cannot go deep into our own selves and discover what has happened to us when we are in a state of moody depression or in a state of melancholy i am not well i don't eat let me be alone let me go to sleep or go for a long walk go for an excursion i let me have a tour these ideas arise in the mind because of a sudden spark of sorrow inside in being alone to one's own self for reasons which one cannot understand but it is necessary to understand what is happening to us ignorance of law is no excuse if you are unhappy you must know why you are unhappy we cannot say i don't know this i don't know business will not work in the world every one has to know the law operating in nature in society in one's own individuality also so psychoanalysis particularly has taken the trouble of going into the depths of these mental operations and disillusioning us from the complacent view that all things are well with us we are not such angels as we appear to be or we pretend to be in human society we are crude matter inside our own selves which comes to the surface only when it is rubbed hard the rubbing hard of the inner potentiality takes place when either the conscious activity ceases because of the exhaustion of its own momentum or because conscious activity becomes impossible due to conditioning factors operating from in from human uh, outside in human society so psychology especially in the field of psychoanalysis has its findings that we are a big cloud of unknowing rather than an illuminated radiance of all knowledge to such an extent are we the cloud that even our intellection rationalization and education we may say even the culture that we seem to be putting on are just adumbrations of a cloud that we essentially are ignorance conditions even our knowledge all our knowledge all our education our culture also seems to be a sort of projection of a basic ignorance of the values of life and this is the reason why educated or not cultured or not that you are you are capable of being unhappy one day neither have you the power that you expect to have nor are you happy in the manner you would like to have nor are you wealthy nothing of the kind is your prerogative this is one side of the picture of the human personality which psychology brings to the surface of our understanding that we are not just that thing which we appear to be in social life we are also something which we are in your, in our individual life the indian counterpart of western psychology has a theory of its own which explains perhaps in greater detail the inner contents of the deeper potentialities 
in Western language called the unconscious, but in the Eastern philosophical parlance called the Anandamaya Kosha, the deepest recesses of our own selves. This Anandamaya Kosha or the unconscious level of our personality is not just something created in this life only. It is not that you are suddenly born into this world from nowhere and all your experiences, pleasurable or otherwise, are created by actions and reactions of this life only. Western psychology does not have the leisure to accept uh, that a previous life of the individual also could be possible but for which present experiences cannot be entirely accounted for. The Anandamaya Gosha or the deepest unconscious is the reservoir of potentiality stored up within our own selves of all frustrated feelings come from various incarnations through which we have passed in earlier types of creation and ages. The stored up potentialities in the Anandamaya Gosha or the unconscious germinate not all at us, at us all suddenly but gradually little by little as it may happen if rain falls only in some part of the world in some other part of the world it does not rain at all so while seeds can be thrown on the soil throughout the earth all the seeds may not germinate at the same time because scarcity of rainfall it will germinate only where conditions are good atmospherically. Likewise, all the potentialities in us do not manifest into action in our life and certain portions of the stock existing only act as conscious life. These percentages or certain aspects or certain packages of the existing stock coming into action in conscious life are called prarabdha karma. The prarabdha is only a retail commodity that is kept by the shopkeeper outside for daily use, but he has more commodity inside in the godown, which is the reservoir of his resources. We are said to be experiencing prarabdha karma, as we know, as it is said well which simply means we are not the whole of what we are even throughout our life. We cannot be that because of the fact the whole storage of the unconscious or the anandamaya cannot come into action because conditions in the world are not permitting the manifestation of all these potentialities. We have to be cosmic individuals suddenly enlarging our dimension to the entire cosmos in order that all the potentialities stored up within can come into action suddenly, which we are not and therefore which we cannot do. Individuals that we are, we have a limited capacity to manifest all the potentialities and so we are just some little things in our individualities and not all things. In the future births that we are likely to take, certain other unused packages of potentialities will be brought into surface of action and we would be different things altogether. Next birth may not be the same thing as now. Neither our experiences of this birth are to be the same in the next birth. We may even change our sexes. A man today need not be a man next birth. A woman today need not be a woman. One can be anything and everything, pleasant or unpleasant, higher or lower. And so, many things is a particular individual. So, to restrict our uh, view of life only to what is available to us today on the conscious surface is not part of wisdom, says Indian psychology. And a similar way, Western psychology also tells us, not going, of course, to such depths that the vision of things manifested by the human mind in the conscious level is an artificially conditioned projection and it is not even the whole of the possibility. There is therefore 
a chance of the reverting of the individual into the baser instincts when occasion arises, though a human being does not always behave like an instinctive animal. The child that is born does not seem to have all these complications in its mind because of all the instincts lying sleeping in the child and it has practically no conscious desires. It has only a biological existence, very little of what we call psychological existence. It lives, it breathes, but it cannot think as a developed conscious mind can think. It gradually grows into the capacity to manifest what was lying latent in itself. It was not merely a biological unit, it was something like a material content earlier in the womb of the mother. It was material stuff only, not even having a life. It assumed life a little later on and the question of psyche operating in it does not arise at all in those rudimentary stages. It gradually manifests these potentialities as it grows into awareness of society and also awareness of what was lying dormant in one's own self. Basically, hunger and thirst are the primary instincts in the human individual. Everything else comes afterwards. When all things go, these only remain. We would like to eat, we would like to drink and then be breathing. That is all what we want and nothing else would be asked. Conditions which are atrocious in life may drive us into that acceptance of a minimum requirement, only food and drink and breathing. This is vegetable existence, biological existence, which is seen manifest in a newborn child, but it becomes more and more artificially construed and constructed when externalizing impulses manifest themselves by way of intensive activity for self-protection, self-preservation. It moves earth and heaven to see that it survives and in any manner it has to survive. The psychological aspect of this situation is that, at least from the point of view of Western psychoanalysis, the mind that the human individual uses in a developed state of individuality is just a kind of instrument that biological instincts use so that from this point of view at least, even today, at the height of our understanding mentally and rationally, we are basically biological, animalistic, full of instincts that are subhuman and the so-called cultures of mankind and the educations of humanity are outer circumstances created by biological conditions for their own survival. All social life is selfish life. This would be the final conclusion of psychoanalysis, basically everybody is selfish to such an extent that one is indistinguishable from an animal. This vision of life which is briefly stated for the further consideration of its implications is to highlight what we can be other than what we are socially, culturally and educationally from our present day understanding of what education is, culture is or social life is. That there is some truth in these findings of psychology and psychoanalysis can be appreciated by every one of us who lives a private life. If at all anyone has a private life in this modern world. 
वी आर नेवर प्राइवेट एट एनी टाइम वी आर बिजी पीपल वी आर ऑलवेज विथ समबडी इन अ फैमिली इन एन ऑफिस हियर देर इन अ मार्केट प्लेस इन अ रेलवे ट्रेन इन अ बस वेर एवर यू आर यू आर विथ समबडी यू आर नेवर अलोन वंडरफुल दैट वी कैन नॉट बी अवर ओन सेल्फ्स देर फोर वी कैन नॉट इवन नो अवर ओन सेल्फ्स दि प्रॉब्लम्स ऑफ ह्यूमैनिटी दैट आर बेसेटिंग इट टूडे are considered by these systems of finding that as outcomes of the hidden potentialities of unhappiness which cannot be brought to the surface of consciousness due to it being conditioned by social life and it being not always possible for the individual to be wholly free to act as one would like to act though dreaming condition yet indian psychology goes deeper than western psychoanalysis and says that there is something eternally operating in us not merely psychologically acting as it is often told us hence the vision of psychology it is entirely true of course from the angle from which it is operating and acting and telling us it is true and yet it is individualistic in its approach and does not take into consideration the non individualistic associations of the human individual on the earlier two days we had occasion to consider certain aspects of human nature which are not just individualistic for psychology and psychoanalysis we are only individuals we are like animals and all our life is just mentally constructed from the point of view of those unseen forces buried in us so that our conscious life seems to be an arena of utter sorrow appearing to be a life of happiness but this is not the whole truth of the matter we have an eternity inside our temporal occupations and experiences all the problems and sorrows of life are misconceived adjustments or rather maladjustments we may say of the human individual basically at essence we are not constituted of sorrow only human nature is not a bundle of griefs it is basically a preparation for eternal happiness which cannot be had under conditions of pressure exerted by any kind of maneuvering of the mind wrongly by maladjustment of itself in the circumstances in which it is placed so the considerations of these doctrines materialistic humanistic psychological whatever they be do not seem to exhaust all the possibilities of human nature there is still an asking beyond us granting all freedom from problems in human existence making one happy in social life giving all the wealth that the earth can bequeath with all these things there would be an asking further a more is there beyond the more that is given to us life is a more potentiality of the individual and not merely a limited possibility of socially restricted individualistic operations thus our considerations of the different visions of life appearing to be interesting very incisive in their probes very valid also in certain fields of life are not exhaustive whatever description one may give about yourself though complete apparently in itself is not really complete no one can describe what a human being is though we can give some sort of a description from the point of view of the physical body social relations offices then what a hope one holds wealth that one possesses and so on and so forth 
all these definitions the bio data of the human individual would not be an exhaustive consideration of the individual there is something more about us than we can think of in our own selves there is an infinity masquerading in the form of individuality an eternity crying for recognition even in the midst of temporal vicissitudes hari om tat sat om purnamada purnamidam purnat purnamadachade purnasya purnamadaya purnameva vasishtate om shanti shanti